there are three phases that I show my love. Am I unselfish in my own personal belief? Have I put myself on a pedestal? That's the first two verses. The second verse is how do I relate to others? Am I showing the God kind of love or is it just on the weekend? And lastly, how do I relate to God? When I read this scripture, I ain't talking about nobody else. I'm talking about dude. Second Timothy th chapter three, um, verses one through six. It reads this in the King James Version. It simply says, this know also that in, la in the last days, perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. As I stand before you today, I, I realize there's this, this scripture and we all say it, the thing that I fear the most shall come upon me. In Job chapter three and verse 25, these are the words of Job. And you realize, you know Job, Job lost his family, his, all of his children uh, in, 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 in a matter of an instant. Uh, he lost his, his, his family, he lost his possessions. It was like one thing after another. When one messenger came, as soon as he heard the bad news, another messenger came, gave him more bad news. And, and sometimes we live the life of Job. We call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves followers of God. And, and when God tests us, we have to really realize whether or not we are Christian, whether or not we are a follower or a child of God. We have to really determine these things. In all reality, Job endured the news of sudden peril. But here's the thing. Job shouldn't have been surprised. If you really pay attention to the story, Job was prepared. When Job, it, the Bible tells us that Job prayed and sent up offerings for his children. He knew they weren't right. He knew something was wrong. How many of us do that? How many of us know something is wrong, but yet and still we, we want to send up prayers instead of getting it right? I'm reading a, a, a book that is, is very eye-open. Matt Chandler wrote a book, and I can't give you everything because I'm just getting into it, and, and, and some of the information that I need is just getting into me. But one thing that I've learned is, is that we've got to recognize to challenge our own selves. I've realized that, that I preach from a perspective that I recognize my own sin. I put my own sin out there, but if I continue to call myself an alcoholic, guess what? I'm still an alcoholic. If I continue to still call myself an addict, guess what? I'm going to still be an addict. What I fail to realize is that we view ourselves from Genesis 3 on. We don't see ourselves in the perfect. We don't see ourselves that as God made Adam and Eve, he made them very good. We don't see ourselves. So when we come to church, the preacher preaches and then all of a sudden we feel guilty. Then we want to get saved all over again and rededicate our lives and then walk back out and be the same old negative person we've always been. Because we latch on to the title. We latch on to the addiction. We latch on to it and nothing changes in our lives. So today is the first day that I make a public statement that I'm no longer the Doug that I've always called myself. I'm no longer the heathen that I've always been. I no longer deal or struggle like I've always struggled, but I'm realizing that he whom the son sets free is free indeed. I do have things that I fall short of, but those things don't identify me. We all have to change our perspective and be identified now with Christ versus being identified with our sickness. Three things I want to give you. Three things that I want us to be aware of. In this, in this text, I want, to, I want you to view this perspective because it's easy, Ridgela, it's very easy to, to read this text and point the finger. 
oh my God, when I read this text, I came and, and I said it, I believe, last week, a week before last, when I, when I sampled this text, I said these words. I said that we have to be careful because Paul is talking to Timothy, saying to Timothy, be aware that these people, these people he was talking about were in the church. But here's the thing that really hit me this week. It ain't the folk in the church that's these people. It's me in the church that's been these people. It's us in the church that have to turn away from this life. It's us that have to turn away from unrighteousness. It's us. It ain't nobody else. There is nobody to blame. There is nobody to point the finger at. It's, it's time for the church to stand in the mirror and say, Lord, I am unworthy. I am unrighteous. Look at these things in me. I'm the one that's treacherous. I'm the one that's filthy. I'm the one, but I want to be righteous. Make me clean. Purge me with his self. Help me, God. This message cautions us that we don't glean from the characteristics that have seeped into the church. That not that we find these people within the church, but that we don't become these people. For the time that is ours to share, I want to remind you that you are made like him. Three things I want to give you to be aware of, to not become it's very easy to become these things, Rod. It's very easy because we spiritualize so many things. And as the, as the saying goes, we're so spiritual that we're no earthly good. We're so much trying to put on the front for people to accept us and to take us in, to call us Christians and call us sons and daughters of God, that we find ourselves being hypocritical. We find ourselves being overtly what we try not to become, the thing that I fear the most comes upon me this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous bolsters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful and unholy this defines how these type of people feel about themselves I want to give you uh, the, 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 in this in this topic, we got to be aware of treacherous hypocrites, treacherous hypocrites. And in understanding, I want to define a treacherous hypocrite is a treacherous is characterized by faithlessness or readiness to betray trust, traitorous, deceptive, untrustworthy or unreliable. It's easy to look at that in somebody else, but can you find it in yourself? A hypocrite is a person who fictitiously represents some desirable or publicly approved attitude, especially one of those private life opinions or statements belie his or her public statements. When I look at this, I can't see nobody else but me. When I look at this, I am totally unworthy to be here. Now, I could rest and stand in my unworthiness or I can look at the grace and mercy of God and the fact that I am still standing here, that this is the opportunity to stop living hypocritical, to stop living treacherously and say, God, I recognize my own wickedness, but I don't want to continue to live in my wickedness. I want to be upright. That means that there's going to have to be some changes. If it took me a few years to perform some of the, the habits that I've had, then it's going to have to take God to transform my life. You're not supposed to be the same when you hear the word. Something is supposed to change. Your life is supposed to be transformed. I talked to my wife this week and I realized on a lot of my own issues, I covered it up with church. I covered it up with business or busyness. But I was self-medicating. And when you self-medicate, you misread your own issues. You misread your own problems. There are things in my life that preaching ain't going to solve. There are things.
things in my life that's sitting in amongst you. It just ain't going to fix it. Love you. But there are some personal things that we all have to deal with. Second Timothy verse three in chapter three and verse one. I'm going to read it from the message Bible. Don't be naive. There are difficult times ahead. As the end approaches, people are going to become self-absorbed, money hungry, self-promoting, stuck up, profane, contemptuous of parents, crude, coarse, dog eat dog, unbending, slanderous, impulsively wild, savage, cynical, and treacherous. I, I, right now, I can't look at you and say that's you. I, I can't look nowhere in the crowd and say, Eddie, that got you all over it. Because if I have the gall to look at you without first saying, God, examine me, Amen. then that looks just like me. Amen. This faith walk that we are all taking is about how God transforms us. It's about how the word of God seeps into our lives and begins to slowly but surely remold and reshape us. We must not think it's strange if, if, if they're in, in church are bad people because the truth of the matter is it's bad folk that come to church. The truth of the matter is there are people who will never fit the, 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 the godliness category. There are people who, who sit in church every week, serve, give the most. You see them all the time. But this is what I've discovered just about me personally. If it fits you, you're more than free to take it. I found out that I stay busy because I try to stay out of sin instead of getting into the word and allowing Christ to transform me from within. I realize I stay in certain situations to keep me focused. And that's a good thing. But there has to be the destruction of my old nature. There has to be a destroying process in my old nature. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I'm reading in Ephesians and in Ephesians, we'll talk about this later. Paul does not call us Christians. As he opens in Ephesians, he deals with us and calls us saints. Christians is only used three times in the Bible. But saints have been used in over 300 plus times just with Paul. Why? Because Paul gets us to see something. We have to take on the identity of Christ. Most of us look like the latest superstar. We jump on the latest fad. We jump on the latest trend. We get the latest red bottom, blue bottom, apple bottom, boots with the fur. And we jump on these things trying to gain identity. And this is what I personally discovered. Every time I went after a set identity, I didn't have my own. So I had to look this part to make it to make myself feel like I met the standard quo. When in all reality, my identity comes from the word. There are going to be good people in church. There are going to be bad people who come to church, who serve, who are in leadership. Here's the thing I want you to remember. Matthew chapter 13, write it down. I'll read it for you. Verse 40, 47 through 50 from the Message Bible. It says, or God's, God's kingdom is like a fishnet cast into the sea, catching all kinds of fish. When it is full, it is hauled onto the beach. The good fish are picked out and put in the tub. Those who are unfit to eat are thrown away. That's how it will be when the curtain comes down on history. The angels will come and call the bad fish and throw them in the garbage. There will be a lot of desperate complaining, but it won't do any good. 
when I preach to y'all, this is another reason that I'm so convicted. Because I'm so busy trying to point and point out that when I fail to realize that what I'm pointing out, I'm really reflecting. My job ain't to point out what Bishop so-and-so did. My job is not to point out when I stand before you, I repent. My job is to lead us closer to Christ. Both good and bad leaders, constituents, and lay people all attend church. This text opens our eyes to this reality, but also reveals the need for all of us, not just me, but everybody in this room has to develop their own personal conviction. While being made like him, realize you will deal with treacherous hypocrites. Not only will you deal with treacherous hypocrites, but those hypocrites and, and sometimes, and remember, it's not them. It's me. We have relational flaws. Without natural affection, verse 3, truth breakers. False accusers, incontinent, meaning that they can't hold it, fierce, despisers of, of those that are good. This defines how these type of people relate to other people. The first model is for selfish reasons. I'm, I'm treacherous. I'm, I'm, I'm in this category because I am important. Not you. The Bible says... Here are the first two, the greatest commandments, love the Lord your God. And secondly, love your neighbor like you love yourself. But if we go after this model, we're no longer being made like God. We begin to look like the, the people in the world and we blend in. That's why there's really no difference in the church and the world because we're saying, hey, we want more people. We want more business. We want more money in the church. And we're mirroring, mirroring what the world has required instead of saying we want more souls even if we don't get more people. Even if we don't get more money, we want to reach people and teach them to be righteous, not to be like Pastor Doug, but to be like God. <sighs> when we read this, this text, verse 3, we often talk about those who live an alternative lifestyle. We often talk with it because the Bible says they're without natural affection. And, and that still holds true. But by the same token, we must recognize that pride is a sin which causes individuals to think less of others and more of themselves than they should. Romans 12 and 3, write it down. Study it for yourself. It simply says this, For I say through the grace of God given to me that every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. I'm supposed to think high of myself. That's called self-esteem. But I'm not supposed to take my self-esteem to a level that I don't see you on the same level. Or greater. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. According as God hath dealt to every man this measure of faith. When a person lives life without natural affection, they has found no fond attachment for love. That means that I do everything to please me. That means that I, I am the only person in the category of what to do when it comes to this type of love and affection. Oh, I feel so convicted. Oh, I feel so heavy right now. I spoke to my wife and I shared with her this week that it's been very difficult that as things in my life occur and the word of God opens your eyes to see, I realize this, and can, can I be honest with you for, four, or for a few minutes? I realize that, Miss TJ, since my dad died, 
I haven't been close or let anybody in. I love people. I love being around people. But I haven't let anybody in. And the fear was that I'd lose you. So if I don't let you get close, you can't get to my heart and I can't get hurt. How in the world selfish is that? When God commands me, and I preach this every week, that we're to love one another unconditionally. And that's one of my biggest failures. One of my biggest failures is that I love, but it's with conditions because I won't let you get close. I apologize to you. I apologize to God's people for being afraid to love, for being afraid to allow you in, for being afraid to be hurt. And in return, the thing that I feared the most was that I hurt you, was that I destroyed the gift of God through the love that he gave to me to give to you unconditionally. I apologize. As a man, that's very hard. As a man, it's very tough to share his heart. We put up walls and we say we're, we're doing this stuff for the kingdom, but we, we got so many walls around us that we're not free. Nobody's free. We come in church and, you know, after, after church is over, as soon as we challenged by the word and been changed day by day, no longer who I was. I'm still the same person, but you can't see because I got the wall painted to look like me. And we walk out. We don't talk to nobody. We don't love on nobody. We don't care for nobody but ourselves. As a leader, if I can teach you anything, forget you. Forget who you think you are. Take yourself off the pedestal and humble yourself. I realize I've done a disservice to my, my wife. I've done a disservice. I got to talk to my wife my children, I got to talk to my family because I have totally destroyed relationships trying to put on a facade that everything is okay. Without natural affections, truce breakers, a truce breaker is one who violates covenants or engagements, a false accuser, incontinent, and lacking in moderation or self-control, especially in sexual desires, fierce, menacingly wild, savage, or hostile, despisers of those that are good. In actuality, these pipe type of people will typically run over others to get their way. And we sit in church and we call on God. And on Monday through Saturday, this is how we act. They will eventually bring home to others to accomplish their own success. Not only do you deal with, while being made like him, you have to deal with treacherous hypocrites. You have to deal with people with relational flaws. But lastly, you have to realize that they're also internally corrupt. They're traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. When I, when I read that now, it's not saying when you see those people, turn away from those people. It's saying when you see that in yourself, turn away. Because I guarantee you, if you be honest, and forgive me English teachers for saying that whole sentence wrong, if you are honest with yourself, I see the majority of this scripture in my own life. And what causes me to turn away is the fact that my eyes are open to the life-changing word of God. And it allows me to say, I no longer want to do that. I no longer want to live a selfish existence. I realize that Christ came. He didn't have to, but he died not for himself but for me, and if I'm going to be a follower of him, then I've got to mimic him. 
I've got to be made like him. What I've been made was like them. I've been looking like them since I called myself saved. I ain't really changed from them. I changed some of the stuff I said. But if my words and my actions don't meet in the middle, you're just talking. Here's a known fact. When a man is positioned by God, he will accomplish the goals and tasks task that God has set for him. But when a man repositions himself, it is usually for his own desires and his own purpose. He is most likely thinking of himself only. He's not concerned with others around him. Nor can he be remotely thoughtful of the value of his relationship with God because he has exalted himself. The scriptures tells us that these individuals will dress the part to present themselves outwardly. The scripture also tells us that these people will speak the part to present themselves orally. However, the scripture makes it painstakingly clear that the interior, if it don't match the exterior, that's the red flag. Look at 2 Timothy in reverse. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. What am I turning away from? From being heady, from being a traitor from being high-minded, from being lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. This is what I realized in this scripture. There are three phases that I show my love. Am I unselfish in my own personal belief? Have I put myself on a pedestal? That's the first two verses. The second verse is how do I relate to others? Am I showing the God kind of love or is it just on the weekend? And lastly, how do I relate to God? When I read this scripture, I ain't talking about nobody else. I'm talking about Doug. I realize I can be conceited. I can be a know-it-all. I can, I can never be wrong. Or I can humble myself. And I can say, God, I stand before these people today. I promise you I had these notes and I hated the fact that I had to preach these notes because this ain't for you. I needed this. I need this life-changing, transforming word. And before now, I couldn't take it. Before now, I wasn't strong enough. Before now, I don't know where I'd be. Samuel the prophet was given the responsibility to choose kings. He was sent and he chose Saul. Saul was what? He was jacked up. Saul was jacked up and, and Samuel was given the same responsibility. And God said, I turn my heart from him. I'm no longer with him. I ain't going to kill him, but I'm just not with him anymore. I need you to go and I'm going to tell you who to go choose. And when I show you when the all pours, that's the person that I want. Samuel went, we all know the story, went to Jesse's house and everybody got an Uncle Jesse. I think about the Dukes of Houses when I think about Jesse, you know. But he went to Jesse's house and, and Eliab passed before him and, and seven of Jesse's sons passed before him and they all were head and shoulders above the rest. They fit the, 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 the status quo. There was something about David, a little servant boy who was out there in the field, who was being trained by God, who had been pulled out and separated. And, and God, through life skills, through shepherding sheep, developed his heart to love people, to worship, or to sacrifice. God chose the one that nobody would choose. God looked not on the outward appearance like we do. 
Pastor Doug, he's just perfect. He's perfect for the job. I guarantee you, there's somebody out there that can do it way better than me. I recognize my own flaws. I recognize that God wants to do something in my life that my own selfishness has stopped him from doing. I wonder why my life is hard. I wonder why things don't go the way I want them to go. It's because I've been in the way the whole time. I'm the reason that I can't move. I'm the reason that God had moved in my life. Today, I want to bless you. I want to bless you and not pray for you or pray a blessing on your life, but I want to help you understand this one thing. This message, to be real honest with you, is a very, very, very condemning message. It's very hard to deal with this subject matter. But I want to share something with you. Something that I learned that, that really I learned from David. This one that was chosen not by people, but by God. David wrote in Psalms chapter 51. You can write it down and go and read it for yourself. Psalms chapter 51 and verse 7. He simply said these words. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall shall be whiter than snow. Here, David refers to the spiritual washing that is required. The reason most of us have not changed is because we have been washed in word only. We have to be changed and transformed both in word and in deed, in conversation and in action. He said, purge me with hyssop, hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow, if I can, but paint a picture for you. Hyssop is a root. It's a plant that is, it only grows to be about three feet tall. And what I realized, I did not pay attention to it, but when God brought the children of Egypt out of the land of Egypt, the night before, when the last plague, the tenth plague came, when the firstborn of every household was to be killed because the angel of death was coming through, the Bible says that they were told to go and get the hyssop plant. And what they did was they cut the hyssop plant and bunched it together, dipped it in the, in the blood of the lamb and spread it on the doorpost. What we fail to do and what we have ceased in doing is spreading the blood on the doorpost of our hearts. We have allowed sin. We have allowed error. We have allowed, allowed conceitedness and every other prideful sin to come in and it is slowly but surely killing us. We've got to ask God to purge us with hyssop. Make us clean. Hyssop acts as a bleaching agent. It is a root that, that once you expose the juice or the, the flavor that's within, it has a minty smell. This is what I love because Exodus 12 and 22 says, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in blood of the Passover lamb that is in the basin and strike the lintel and two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out of the house until the morning. We've got to learn when it comes to living a life that is pleasing to God to follow the complete instructions. There is a remedy. I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, if you stand in this category like I feel that I'm standing even as I minister to you, I don't see myself as wretched anymore. I see myself as becoming more and more righteous. Why? Because I'm finding that this remedy is true. In Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, it says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. For he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that shall be desired of him. This is the remedy. The remedy is recognizing that you and I can never be so righteous that we can redeem ourselves. Yet, when I read in this scripture, as, as convicted as I am, as terrible as I feel, there is a king, there is a ruler 
who humbled himself to serve us. In Jesus' very own words, he said these words. In John chapter 12 and 32, write it down, you read. If I, and I, if I, be lifted up from the earth, I'm going to pause and park right there and get out of your way because we have been so inundated with the false belief that God, that, that our worship causes God to live. Can, can I help you understand something? He, he don't need your worship. He, he, he didn't say, if I, if I be lifted up through your worship. He said, I'm going to come down. I'm going to put my deity down. And I'm going to come to earth in the same form of sinful man. I'm going to overcome sin. It won't even affect me. Why? Because I want to prove to man that it can be done. I know you can't do it. I know alone you can't do it. But he was cut off. The hyssop, the cleansing blood, has been, he's been dipped in the blood. He's put it on the doorpost of our hearts. And here he said, and I, if I be lifted from the earth. See, here's the thing. David Blaine, as many magic tricks as he performs, can't perform what Jesus did. Jesus said, if I be lifted, not up in worship, not doing a praise team rehearsal, but if I be lifted from a dead position, then I'll draw men unto me. Here's what I need you to understand. As I shut my mouth and open my heart for God to fill me all over again, God died. He sent his son to die for us. And the purpose that he died, he came, put his deity down so that he can prove to us that he alone is God. No man can refute the fact that Jesus walked the face of the earth. No man can refute the fact that they saw him on a cross. No man can refute the fact that his body was nowhere to be found and witnesses saw him. So why should I believe in myself? Do I want to be made like them? Or do I want to be made like him? Because my Bible promises me that if I can put down my evil ways, if I can put down my sinful nature, that one day I'm going to catch up with him. One day he will be my brother and I'll reign with him. So do I want to stick with them? Or do I want to be made like him? Father, I bless you. Father, thank you. God, thank you for just being God. When I think of my treacherous nature, my relational flaws, and my internally corrupt nature, God, thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the purging and the washing and the transformation that only you can bring. Father, give me what you want me to have. My desire is your desire. My ways yield to your way. Father, allow us as a church, as a body, to be redefined by what you identify. Move Doug Gumby out of the way. Move the personality-driven church. And you come. You rule. You reign. It's in Jesus' name I pray.